Thank you everyone for being here. A very warm welcome. We hope you have enjoyed the conference so far. We had five very amazing sessions and we couldn't, we couldn't answer to all the questions in time. That shows that there's a lot of interactivity going on. People are very hungry and would like to find out more. For those of you who don't know much about TVN, the Transformational Business Network Asia is a nonprofit that believes in fighting poverty through enterprise. We, have, we take an ecosystems approach and we believe in collaboration, empowerment, dignity, hope, and restoration. Here's how we take an ecosystem approach to alleviating poverty. We do that through five pillars. Uh, the Social Enterprise Training Hub being one of them, and that's the one that I'm personally leading. We, we, it's an investment readiness program where we put high potential social enterprises to get them to be ready to scale up through impact investments. Then we have the Expertise Network. This is essentially a skills-based volunteering network where we invite professionals. Uh, whether you're a lawyer, you're an accountant, you're a, a salesperson, we believe you have something to contribute to social impact. Conference and events, this is the one that you guys are currently in, where we connect stakeholders and help you to be able to contribute to impact more. Investor clubs, this is the one where if you are new to in impact investment and would like to try out uh, one or two investments, uh, this is one avenue where we invite, we will bring you in and you can allow you to interact with other potential investors. The resilience program, this is where all the proceeds of this conference is being channeled to. Now there are three legs to this, in, to this resilience program. The first one is matchmaking and uh, creating targeted grants, which we call productive charity, as how my colleague Alex calls it. And we also have another piece called the resilience fund. This is a debt financing vehicle that we have just created uh, and pilot, are piloting in Malaysia and Indonesia. Not to worry, we will tell you a little bit more about that in a bit. Now this session wouldn't have, this conference wouldn't have been possible without the support of our generous sponsors. So we would like to thank all of you once again for making this conference possible. Now, before I jump into the session proper, uh, we just want to give you one last, one last 30, 10 seconds to just fill out the poll and I will, and it in the next three seconds. All right. So most of the attendees seem to be coming from Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, a couple from Australia and other parts of the world. We have a good representation from nonprofits, a very healthy representation from social enterprises, which is great. So another, a warm welcome to all of you guys again. All right, welcome once again. My name is Wayne Shia, and as mentioned, I lead one of the five pillars, the, so the SEF program. And uh, today's session is very special to me. And the reason why it's very special to me is because having spent the first decade of my professional life in a startup, I know that there are some problems that are very unique to entrepreneurs and let alone social entrepreneurs. So as a result of that, I, I, I really wanted to be, I really wanted to put together a panel where, where entrepreneurs actually share their stories of resilience and hope. Let's, let's be honest here, uh, with the COVID season, things are going to get bad. So, we, we don't have all the answers, but we want to let you hear how other entrepreneurs have overcome their challenges and hopefully that will inspire you to press on and be encouraged. And also because this session is special, I've also invited a special person, uh, Christopher Yeo, founder and CEO of Sentient IO, a fast growing AI platform company. Chris and I trace many years back. He's a friend, he's a mentor. He used to sit on my, my startups advisory board and having been involved in five different startups, he's in his fifth startup now, he has a lot of stories and advice to give. So he's one of those guys I used to call up and say, Chris, I got this very interesting uh, challenge. What would you do in my position? Or do you have any advice? 
So he's one of my go-to guys, and which is why I thought there's no better person to be moderating this panel than Chris. So over to you, Chris. Uh, Chris, alternate A, please, to unmute. Thanks. Hi. Hi, everybody. My name is Chris. And uh, I, as, as Wayne has said, uh, I am an entrepreneur myself, and I've spent quite a long time in this field. Uh, even during the best of times, we know that entrepreneurship is very hard. And what more with this global pandemic happening? It's, it's really tough on many people. However, uh, it is all still surmountable. So failures are inevitable, uh, but the main thing is how we pick ourselves up when we fail or when we fall. So if you are a social entrepreneur, uh, getting support from members are also very, very important. So today we have four very inspiring entrepreneurs and uh, they are Daniel from Pop Jai, David from Water Realm, Joy from Basama, and Joan from Thoughtful. So I would like them to give you a, a brief introduction of themselves, all right? So over to you, Daniel. Hi, I'm Daniel from Pop Jai, uh, a F&B social enterprise in Singapore. You know, uh, welcome, welcome here. So just to share with you about what we do. Uh, so we employ actually from the eight different beverage group in, in Singapore, from the underprivileged uh, and the marginalized community. So uh, through a sustainable business model, uh, we provide employment opportunities and training to equip our employees with relevant skills, empowering and meeting their individual needs uh, in many other ways. One of it is through constant innovations. With that, 90% uh, of my whole entire workforce coming from this particular group. And we aim to provide good and affordable food uh, to every single one of them through business. Very good. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, David, over to you. Tell us about Water Rome. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is David, and thanks for inviting me. Uh, thanks to TBN and all the sponsors as well. Uh, so I run a company called uh, Water Room, and we are a social enterprise based in Singapore as well, catering to Southeast Asia and the region uh, with regards to providing clean drinking water through this innovative uh, water filtration systems that we develop in-house. Uh, we uh, cater to the communities that are hit by disasters as well as those in rural communities. And we develop uh, specifically portable and highly mobile and fast deploying uh, water filtration solutions that can be self-sustaining in many of these uh, locations. So since uh, about six years ago, since we started, we have reached out to about 33 countries so far where we have uh, our, our product reach has gone. Uh, and we work a lot with NGOs, governments, and any relief or humanitarian bodies. Yeah, our, our flagship uh, solution would look like a bicycle pump. Uh, instead of pumping air, it will be filtering water from rivers, wells, streams, or any form of water sources that's on the surface. And we can be able to re remove the bacteria and the virus so that it produces high uh, levels of safety, fil uh, clean, filtered water immediately. Yep, so that's for us. That is so cool, David. Now, over to Joy. Could you tell us a little bit about what you and Basama are doing? Hi, I'm Joy. Um, I'm a Korean American expat living in Jakarta since 2014. I'm the director of an organization called YICF um, that empowers underserved communities in Indonesia, more specifically Jakarta. So we're incubating a program called Bersama, started in August 2019, where we're tackling two issues. One is um, refugees in Indonesia who are not allowed to work locally and cannot support themselves. Two is um, youth unemployment, which is one of the highest in the ASEAN region in Indonesia. So we have 60 refugees and Indonesian young adults um, whom we are connecting to online work as data labelers for artificial intelligence companies. Um, we provide learning experiences through professional development and English classes. 
And then we also provide a way for them to belong in a very unique multicultural co-working community. That's it. Thank you, Joy. That really resonated with me. Now, the next person is Joan. And before Joan speaks, she would like to play a little video for you. Okay, there wasn't a sound for that. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> right, Joe, maybe you can tell us a little bit it's about fine. what It's fine, don't think. worry. I can talk to it. Thank you so much, Chris. And welcome right. everybody. Thank you for making time on um, uh, so, so quickly after the riot break to join us on this panel. My name is Joan Lowe and I'm the founder and CEO of Thoughtful. Thoughtful is a digital mental health care company that uh, essentially aims to provide affordable and accessible mental health solutions. So we do this through two ways, one of which was uh, briefly showed in that video, um, but I'll talk to it. The two ways are through thoughtful education, where we actually raise mental health literacy through interactive programs. They used to be mostly offline programs, but now it's mostly online, uh, reasons for which we know why. Uh, and the other one, uh, the other line of business that we do have is actually Thoughtful Chat. Uh, so this is a subscription-based mobile chat platform that connects users to certified mental health professionals uh, who are you know, uh, certified counselors, psychologists, psychiatrists, uh, so that users can access affordable daily bite-sized coaching uh, anytime, anywhere. Uh, so we're, I guess, based out of Singapore and Malaysia, or to make it simply uh, based out of Southeast Asia. Uh, my background is quite different before coming into social entrepreneurship, because I used to work at a Wall Street bank in Hong Kong before this. So I was actually at JP Morgan for about six years uh, before I decided to move back to Southeast Asia, where I'm originally from, uh, to really try and fill up the gaps of uh, the mental health space. We did not start digital, uh, but we have evolved into that. Um, the story from which you'll probably hear more later. Uh, but yeah, it's been, it's been a great journey for the last two years, and I'm happy to share that with you uh, over the course of the panel and at the Q&A later, which I hope everyone will be joining. So yeah, thank you, Chris. Thank you, very nice. All right, now audience need to do something. I'd like to uh, do a poll now of the audience about what you think about the current economy and what were your greatest challenges. So, okay, everybody, all of you in the audience, let's do this poll. So tell us a little bit about what you think about the regional economy and what your greatest challenge was. All right. I think once we've got enough uh, responses, let's take a look at uh, the poll. Okay. In five, four, three, two, one. Right, let's see what everybody thinks. Wow, many of you think that the economy will only return uh, to normal in December 2021. Okay, that is a long time, but yeah, quite a lot of people seem to think that way. And what was your greatest challenge as an entrepreneur or in your job? Uh, most of you said money. <laughs> of course, I think that's one of the hardest things to come by these days. And then the next thing was relationships. Hmm, that is quite an interesting thought as well. Conflict with values. I think uh, uh, many of us have gone through this. 5% uh, of you say health. Well, that is true. Some of us overwork and our health suffers. Thank you so much, everybody, for uh, your responses. Very enlightening. Very interesting to hear where you are going with this. 
Now, the first thing I'll really like to find out uh, from our uh, inspiring entrepreneurs here is what actually led you to the founding of your social enterprise and what were your greatest challenge? Uh, do share uh, with us about how you go through all this, starting with Joan. Joan, you want to tell us a little about Thoughtful? Sure, no problem. Uh, always good to be the first one, I guess. <laughs> Uh, well, I guess the, the whole story um, is an interesting one, not a very conventional one, I have to say. But before I do start um, uh, sharing this part of the story, uh, maybe, LJ, could I just invite you to pull up the polls? Thank you. Uh, guys, everyone who's participating, I would love to get you involved in this process, and I'd love to get to know you better as well. Unfortunately, we can't have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with all a uh, hundred over of you. So this is uh, our little way of getting you involved. Uh, if you would just take some time and maybe, you know, just answer very candidly, you know, don't second guess your, your answers. Uh, you know, how, how has the COVID pandemic um, affected you? Whether it's from the quality of sleep, your current stress and anxiety levels. Uh, and also curiously to f find out, you know, is uh, are you doing anything currently to to uh, proactively engage in your wellness? Uh, maybe we'll give you a couple of seconds to to um, get your responses in. All closing in five, four, three. Two, one. All right. Let me have a look at this. Um, okay. It seems like a pretty fair uh, group. So quality of sleep, I think most of us um, have expressed no change. In terms of current stress levels, uh, medium to high. And then in terms of Proactively engaging in our mental well-being. The majority, three quarters of you say, yes, I love this. I would love to get to know what it is you're doing uh, and maybe even, you know, share some of these ideas across, across the room. Uh, so thank you so much for that. Uh, I just wanted to get a feel of how much, I guess, uh, uh, awareness the room has when it comes to mental wellness. So Thoughtful started... Um, it really, I call it a, a calling that's 20 years in the making. Like I mentioned briefly before just now, uh, I had a very different life before this. Highly corporate uh, and, and very much a for-profit kind of uh, environment. And I decided to take the leap of faith and give up that life, uh, you know, back in 2018. And one of the reasons for that is because myself and my family you know, we've been caregivers ourselves. Uh, we have been caregivers to a loved one who has been living with a, a mental affliction for the past 20 years. And, you know, putting ourselves 20 years ago, the understanding for mental health was, especially in Asia, was very low, if, if even existent. Uh, and so a lot of it, you know, was through trial and error. It was something that we had to discover over time and it was it was a journey that was not easy, uh, I have to say, uh, but but one that was very enriching and obviously you know brought everyone closer together. Uh, and, and so I guess you know why make that move now as opposed to earlier, right? Since it has been twenty years, uh, the reason is because I I have spent a lot of time. I'm originally Malaysian, uh, but I've spent most of my adulthood abroad uh, for the past you know 15 years and having lived in north america you know canada us lived in france for a bit lived in china for a bit and then hong kong for the last six years before moving back to singapore actually um a lot of i think it gave me a lot of exposure to how mental health was addressed and treated uh in all these different parts of the world from north america to europe to north asia and, and it made me realize just how vast the gaps were and how many uh, things were missing and how much more development was needed in this space. 
uh, of course, you know, the challenges that we personally still experience up to today is a constant reminder of, you know, what we still need to develop. Uh, and so really, that was why, you know, the, it, it was a personal calling that was 20 years in the making, uh, when I realized that not much had changed in the last 20 years in this ecosystem. That's when I decided to make a judgment call, uh, leave that Wall Street career and then move back and, and, and see what we could do. So Thoughtful did not start out as a digital company. It did not start out as a health tech company. Really, we, I, I came back with a very open mind, open heart, knowing that, you know, uh, there was much to learn because while we know one case use case, which is my own personal use case very well, it might not be the same everywhere else. Uh, so we actually spent um, the first, I would say, 12 to 18 months of Thoughtful being on the ground. And that's why we actually started with Thoughtful Education. Uh, we ran mental health literacy programs uh, for the general population across the board. So these are, you know, these are not preaching to the choir. These are people who are not yet um, diagnosed, you know, high performing individuals like yourself and myself. And we went from, you know, we did programs for corporates, for NGOs, for governments, for schools, university, the whole gamut. We reached uh, almost 2000 people directly face to face. Uh, and we also ran assessments for these people to test for uh, the most common ones will be stress, anxiety, and also depression. And having done that groundwork, uh, we started raising, you know, the red flag because we started flagging one in three individuals of the population that we were reaching for severe or extremely severe in one or more categories. And in the beginning, we actually thought that um, the best solution was to uh, provide them with information and then, you know, refer them out to, to uh, the help that they need or the support that they need. Uh, but what we realized very quickly was that it was not sufficient. It did not work. Um, one of the issues we uh, started facing really quickly was that uh, the no-show rates were really high. Even if we made the appointments and they just needed to rock up for the appointment, uh, they still wouldn't show up. And that's, you know, just testament to the fact that stigma is still a pretty big concern when it comes to mental health in Asia. Uh, and also, uh, even if they did show up, uh, most of the time, the follow through rates were very low, meaning to say that maybe they go once, they go twice, and then they stop. Um, and so when we dug deeper, um, it became very apparent that affordability and financial sustainability of engaging with your mental health was just not uh, was just not achievable or attainable with the current household, average household income in Southeast Asia. So these were some of the biggest challenges that we faced. Um, it was affordability, accessibility, and the stigma. Accessibility because, you know, in, in developing countries, it can take you two hours to go from the office to a clinic and then back. Uh, and so we needed a better way. Uh, and that was really how we started piloting Thoughtful Chat last year. Uh, third quarter of last year, we started figuring out ways of trying to solve our own issue, which was to ensure that the people we did reach, um, you know, had had a, a, a meaningful way of following up and engaging and getting the support that they need. Uh, and so that's how Thoughtful Chat came about. And, and we started uh, bringing, I guess, technology into the picture because that was the only way of making it most affordable and most accessible to people. Uh, and also to make it very, um, I guess, you know, breaking the stigma, but not the bank, uh, because you could re very well be talking to your husband or your loved one, or you could be talking to a professional and no one would know better. Uh, so that really helps with the stigma. Uh, so yeah, I guess in short, that's really how uh, Thoughtful came about and how we've evolved. Yeah. Um, in terms of the challenges, I guess, you know, I can go in now or I can talk about it later, but it was really finding that balance between impact and business. Um, and these were, you know, two very competing hey. philosophies. Yeah. Thank you, John. That's cool. What an interesting story. Now, David, over to you, David. Uh, what led to the, the founding of your social enterprise and what were you, your challenges, David? All right. Thanks. Uh, so... 
My journey started off about six years ago in 2014. And back then, I was in the final year of my university. Uh, I was studying finance in the National University of Singapore Business School. So to jump into the world of water is uh, quite far apart from where I, I originally envisioned, right? Uh, so uh, it took really quite a bit of uh, soul searching and self-reflection uh, coming towards, uh, 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 coming to, to realize that there is a passion that I have in using business as a force for good and a way to impact uh, society. Uh, I did not actually know about what the term social enterprise mean when we first started in 2014. Uh, I only knew that at that point of time, uh, as not, when I was about to graduate, I always on, enjoyed the process of entrepreneurship as well as starting something. So in school, I would have already been starting uh, various clubs and, and being involved in uh, organizing camps or organizing activities regularly. And it's, it's part of my passion. Uh, and, and so when it came to finally deciding on what I wanted to do, uh, I actually went through a series of events that led me to, to, to realize that, that uh, there's more to, to life than just a, a dollars and cents and money and, and that this passion and creativity and in, in innovation or entrepreneurship that I, I have can be put to uh, good use if it, if it is for purposes that can benefit society. So, uh, just as I was about to graduate, PUB, the public utility board in Singapore, actually launched their inaugural accelerator program. It was called Hydropreneur. And I felt that why not just try it out because uh, water, clean water is a very important thing for many uh, parts of the world and even in the region in, in Southeast Asia. Uh, I've been on various uh, mission trips and overseas community programs with school and with uh, uh, on voluntary basis as well. And I've seen the, the situation of how children, especially are the ones who suffer from this uh, serious problem of drinking contaminated water. And yet it's something that we take for granted a lot of times in Singapore and many of the places uh, that are developed, more developed. We turn on the tap and we assume that clean water is a natural thing that most people have. Uh, but this reality is not the case. So uh, it took a journey to, to, con to, to understand more about the problem uh, over a one-year period before we got, uh, me and my other founders got more and more convicted about this work that we do at Water Room. Yeah, but when we first started at the accelerator program, our mission was mainly to solve uh, clean water challenges in disaster situations. So we, we, did, we came up with a device that was 40 kilograms uh, and, and it was very big, very chunky and we tested it out, right? Like uh, uh, we wanted to test out whether it works. So we brought it down to the ground. Uh, unfortunately, the first health crisis that we faced was that uh, while carrying what this prototype and device, one of our team members, uh, because of the weight, uh, especially when it's filled with water, uh, one of our team members suffered a slip disc uh, injury and he had to be uh, coming, he had to come back to Singapore quickly to, to get a surgery done. Uh, that's when we realized that a lot of other systems out there which claim that it's very portable, very easy to bring out, uh, especially during uh, disaster relief situations, uh, is actually not the case because uh, portability can mean a lot of things. Uh, it's a whole spectrum of definition. So that's when we realized we have to uh, set up very strong key principles of design in our innovation. And we came up with uh, simple, portable, durable, and affordable. So durability and uh, portability became one of our, our key uh, important uh, design features. So portability became, uh, the definition for us is that it must be backpackable and it can be easily brought into the furthest to reach places on earth, right? That's why we, we came up with our flagship uh, design today, which is the bicycle pump uh, water filter. Yeah, so I think the first uh, challenge that we had was on the health side. Uh, I can definitely elaborate on the financial aspect of it. I think a lot of people have faced this, uh, but maybe I can I can do that later on when the rest of the speakers have introduced. Thank you, David. Wow, that was very ingenious. Uh, bicycle pump kind of thing. Cool. Now, over to Daniel. 
So Daniel, what led you to the founding of your social enterprise and what was your greatest challenge in doing so? Hmm. I think uh, for me, the, the thing is that uh, just like David, I did not know what is actually a social enterprise is until in 2017. All right, that is only when I, I get to know. In fact, uh, Pokja has been uh, operating for the past, uh, since uh, 2012. So it has been eight years, right? Uh, so uh, what, what actually um, from me is that uh, to, to start this whole business model is, I always ask myself this question is that actually what's, what's the purpose in life? What's the reason of me doing that? You know, a lot of what, a lot of why, uh, because I, I personally have felt is that if we want to start something, we need to know the purpose and we need to know what are we doing it for. So with that, uh, I came up with a conclusion, why not use business trade you know, as a purpose and yet I can do more to help others. So what I did is, uh, I, I, I actually, I, I personally, I'm from the F&B industry since young. So I, uh, I didn't go to school, no, I didn't go to school. Uh, I started on the wrong note. Uh, I've been brushed with the law for many, many times. <laughs> All right. So with that, um, FMB is my only solution or an only career in my life. So uh, with that, I see that, hey, since in FMB, there are always uh, issues that they are trying to tackle, which is the manpower issues. So how can I really do something to improve it or to break the chain in that area. So uh, I came up with a solution by uh, employing different, different groups of beneficiaries in Singapore. You know, they need a job, right? So why not we, we train them, we mold them, we shape them to, to accommodate them to work for us. So with that, uh, that's how I created my, my company, you know, uh, by using different innovations, uh, believing Believing in that, hey, uh, with a mindset of never try, never know. To say, hey, it can a uh, physical disabled uh, person, which is a stroke or amputated person, can they work in the F and B industry as a chef, as a, a food prep you know, employee? So I came out with a customized shopping board for them to cut. Uh, we came out with the uh, cashier counter that is lowered for the wheelchair bound. And in fact, uh, our visually impaired employees who are blind, complete blindness, all right, they are also our chef as well who can cook. Um, so that's how I do that. Um, one of the greatest challenge, I think, uh, one of the greatest challenge for me now, personally is time. Okay? Time is always the factor. I believe that all panelists will agree with me that time is a challenge. Um, do I find that working with the beneficiary is difficult? Do I find that working with them is, is, is tough? Um, surprisingly, it's no. All right, working with them is enjoy, it's enjoyable, you know. Uh, it actually more me as well, you know, to that, to that extent. Yeah, hand over to you. That was very, very inspiring. Thank you so much, Daniel, for sharing your story. And now, over to Joy. How about you, Joy? What led you to the founding of your enterprise and what challenges did you experience during that time? Yeah, so the founding kind of really came out of three things that converged. Um, one was a personal discontent that was growing. And then second is um, environmental factors and uh, our organization and where it was. Um, and then third was a business opportunity that fell into our laps. So the first thing is um, uh, I had been a lecturer for 2.5 years prior to joining YICF in 2018. Um, so before that, I was working at a private business school as an entrepreneurship lecturer. And I was observing that our graduates are totally unprepared for the modern workforce. And unemployment is just a huge issue here, even for those who are educated and coming out of private schools. Um, and so I was really frustrated with the education system and observing a, a whole lot of educational learning experiences growing in the, even in the non-traditional sector, um, vocational programs, all kinds of training coming up, but not really achieving impact, actual market outcomes, actual placements of people in jobs. 
Um, so I was getting frustrated with the educational landscape here and the gap between education and marketplace. Uh, and then I was also teaching about the industrial revolution 4.0 and how it's going to really hit economies around the world. And you see it affecting even Indonesia with a lot of structural unemployment. So I was kind of um, personally feeling more and more passionate about doing something about this. Then as I joined YSCF as the executive director, um, we were already serving refugees and low income Indonesians through education. But you give them education and then you, what, you know, where do they go from there? And there was no hope for them in the future, especially refugees, because they can't work here. They're not allowed to have jobs. And so um, our organization and at the board level, we were thinking, how do we really empower people um, and give hope for the future without just training for the sake of training and saying, well, the actual work part is up to you, but we'll just help you get right up to that point. And then you have to figure it out. Uh, so we're looking, scanning the horizon. What can we do to really empower people um, beyond education and with vocation? And while we were looking at um, the environment and opportunities uh, through a series of very unusual connections, we got the opportunity to potentially partner with a large global machine learning service firm to set up a data labeling workforce in Indonesia. So for them, it's purely a business deal, and it was economically very attractive to try this out in Indonesia. For us, we saw right away this is an opportunity, um, not just to uh, create an income generation opportunity for refugees and Indonesians needing jobs, but also to build a vocational program that is exemplary, um, that integrates learning with um, concrete work experience and actual income as well as a unique experience that changes lives. So a community where they join and they, they make friendships and build relationships that really form them as people. Um, and then out of that program, seeing Indonesians moving on to their dream jobs or pursuing a career, their next step, uh, while the refugees, they can't go into local employment, but continuing to work online and growing with us within our program. So that was the vision that started to come form, um, form in our minds as we were talking with this company. Um, I had never been exposed to the artificial intelligence industry uh, before. I mean, I, I've studied it, I researched it, I would teach it, but I never knew what the inside of the industry looks like and the whole supply chain around um, data for machine learning and how all of that works. But in any case, we just threw ourselves into the conversations. Um, I had to build a statement of work and a proposal that was about 40 pages long to outline what we would do if we partnered with a company. And uh, it was a very stressful period because I was also leading the rest of our organization and all of our other um, sub organizations. So it was a crazy time, but somehow we landed the deal uh, and we had amazing connections inside that partner company that really wanted to try this out. They were compelled, uh, they were fascinated that a nonprofit wants to try this out with such a large global for-profit firm. And we landed the deal in June. And then the um, challenge was to set up within one month, uh, while they were still signing the agreement uh, with us, uh, the agreement was signed 1st of August, but we were expected to be up and running two weeks later with our first batch of workers, about 30 people. So we, um, we had to move many things in parallel, uh, getting a facility, recruiting people, um, figuring out our operations, hiring the actual team, because I, I needed to hire someone to do this. But somehow it, it came together and we were able to leverage all the volunteers in our, uh, or staff members in our other programs under our y YICF umbrella, bring them on board to help run the interviews and select candidates and all of that. And so we got up and running but it was a very, very stressful period. Um, and, and, and then after that, there were other challenges that came, but somehow we're still here. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very interesting story, Joy. The AI is something right at my heart. Now, you know, uh, academia, people who are lecturers and all that, they sometimes find a very big uh, difficulty in transiting into social business or, or business in general. So was your transition very difficult? Why and how? Um, not 
really, I think because I did my MBA, I was already, um, I've always wanted to be at the intersection of business and education. Um, And I had worked extensively with nonprofits, but seeing the power of the private sector. And so for me, it was a good alignment of my interests. And I felt that the academic environment, um, the traditional academic environment is a bit too restrictive now to adapt to changes quickly. Even you see that uh, happening in the COVID period, a lot of universities and schools trying to figure out what to do. Uh, But I think businesses and even Mm non-traditional educational academies were already ahead of the curve. Um, So I, I, I actually really enjoyed going back into the nonprofit world I'm working with nonprofit organizations, but I already planned from the beginning, I want to be in the business world somehow through the nonprofit. Oh, nice. Nice. Um, I'm going to ask Daniel a very interesting question. Uh, Daniel, you know, Daniel, you shared a little bit about your difficult um, uh, childhood and your challenges about education and all that, or lack of education. But was it difficult for you, even though, those were the challenges. Was it difficult for you to start your social enterprise? Uh, nope. Okay. Mm. Yep. Uh, for me, it's no. I'm I'm actually quite fortunate to actually, uh, because with the skills that I had mm. on hand, uh, I could I could actually uh, excel in, in the industry. But uh, unfortunately, there are still uh, a big group of them who are in the in the community or in 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 the in the, in the ground who are. Right who are not engaged and they do not have the relevant skills. So the question, the big question is that how can we really support them? One, two, how can we help them to break the cycle? You know, to achieve something that, hey, it can be poverty, it can be um, uh, social issues. Okay? How can we really, that is the big question, see. Uh, how can we really help them? Is it by providing them with employment only or is there any other ways that we can support them further? So that is something that uh, is in, in, in mind when it comes to uh, employment, where we take into certain considerations, you know, how can we support them? So in Pop Jai, uh, we have this very funny and unique policy. Okay, it's called a never stop hiring policy. Wow. Never stop hiring policy. So um, people who know Pop Jai, uh, since 2012, we have not ceased operations and ceased you know, hiring of anyone, even in COVID season. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm quite crazy. So in this COVID season, we are employing even more people. You know, it, it be, and we extend it to, to not just uh, the beneficiaries alone, we also want to see that how we can actually support the, the private hires, and the taxi driver as well. So we turn them into one workforce. Okay, at the same time, they help us to generate incomes. With that, we also think of ways to support that, right? We also feed families with meals, sponsored meals together with it. So these are things where providing employment and and also supporting them in social issues together. Yeah. Wow, that's very, very inspiring. I, I like that story. Now, uh, Joan, Joan, you said that, you know, you came from a, um, um, a Wall Street environment and then you came out to do this. What was the most difficult adjustment you had to do uh, in your transition, in, in your life? What's the most difficult thing? Uh, well, I guess that the biggest challenge was actually before making the leap. I think that was the biggest challenge, Um, giving up, you know, uh, uh, an income (laughs) Um, and and the security that came with that. Uh, That was, of course, a lot of um, a lot of pushback as well uh, as to why I'm doing this. Uh, Are you sure you want to do this? Uh, Mm -hmm. Are you crazy? Which, (laughs) you know, I got a lot of from both. Uh, people within the firm and also, you know, in, in, in my house, um, you know, th- there were there were a lot of these uncertainties um, in the beginning. And I think that was one of the biggest challenges to actually take the leap. Um, and then once that did happen, uh, I think 
you know, it, the, the transition, yes, it was um, not, uh, I won't say it's a bed of roses. It, there is quite a lot of a change uh, to, uh, to adjust to, but I think it was something that um, I felt was very natural and it was the right thing to do. Because even when I was in the Wall Street sector, I was very much involved in the Hong Kong impact investment space. And I was very curious already um, about how we can harness, you know, the world of the world of finance or the world of the private sector um, and, and, and use it for good. Uh, and the whole idea of doing well and doing good was always something that uh, I was inspired by and that I wanted to also live by as just a personal philosophy. And so it made the transition much easier, uh, even though, of course, you know, there are all the little uh, privileges that you have to give up. But I think it's one of those things where if the why is very big, um, personally, and also, you know, from, from a bigger perspective, like mental health is something that has been a part of my, it has defined my whole, you know, childhood and adulthood. Um, it, it, it was, it, it made everything very worth it. Until today, I still, I mean, whenever there are challenges, I still remind myself of that big why um, of, you know, making sure I, I, I know why I'm on this path. So, yeah. Very good. You have a North Star then. <laughs> That's nice. That's nice. David, you started your uh, enterprise so soon after school. Uh, was that a very difficult thing for you to do? Um, I mean, I'm sure um, your parents would have said something, your family would have said something, your friends would have said something. So, so what, what difficulty did you have? Yeah, I think, thanks for the question, because it's very relevant and very, uh, uh, yeah, relatable, especially for those who just came out of school and, and want to do uh, the entrepreneurship journey. Uh, I always have the question like, do, should I, should I uh, go into the industry first and learn uh, from other companies before I start something or should I just, just start something immediately? Uh, I think there's pros and cons to both situations is whether you're okay to manage uh, either of those situations. For me, I always wanted to be in entrepreneurship. And so sometimes I don't think before I jump and leap, uh, I just try to build your wings along the way while you're falling down. Uh, and because of that, uh, I, I guess that's why I started uh, immediately out of school. And I think the challenge is uh, it's not so much the the opportunity cost because you feel that your your opportunity cost is not as high when, once you're, you're just coming out of school. But I think it's the lack of capital. Uh, you have uh, hardly any savings. I mean, uh, when we first started, uh, all of us, we, we mainly came together and put about 10,000 Sing dollars, uh, which is about, I think, seven, 8,000 US dollars. So uh, it's not a lot to start off with, but I guess uh, it helps because uh, we're a hardware startup. And I think it's even harder, especially if you have to develop uh, physical products, which needs to be tested out in the field. I think that's a challenge as well, because every time we test a product, we have to travel overseas and be able to uh, pay for those traveling costs, uh, pay for the deployment, uh, pay for the, the cost of the products that are being tested. Uh, and each time the, the product doesn't work or fails, it's actually a few thousand dollars in because you don't have mass manufacturing costs and everything is made by hand. So I think in the initial days, financial uh, capital uh, challenges are definitely there. Uh, I think uh, in terms of pay, right, just uh, almost, almost uh, uh, prepare that within the, the first almost the first six months to 12 months will your pay is definitely uh, either negligible or, or just uh, uh, very minimal. And that's to help the cash flow of the, the business as much as possible, mm -hmm. uh, especially if it's a hardware company. So uh, what, we, what we were very blessed with is to have uh, different partnerships that gave us a lot of access into many of the communities that we, we still work today. Uh, with, uh, for example, we worked together with World Vision uh, in Malaysia, and that was our first partner that really helped us substantially in in uh, covering some of our costs. Uh, also, because uh, we we did another project on the side, we say that 
since we are testing out our filters on the ground, can we also do some water-related uh, projects for you? And so they said, okay, we'll, we'll cover your cost. You come here, you do a, a consultation project for us, and at the same time, we will cover your cost for testing out the products. Right? So I think that really helped to stretch our dollars, uh, especially at the start when capital is very, very low. Uh, other than that is raising some small grants from school, from university, uh, which has been very supportive. Uh, they have provided us with uh, uh, space and tools. Uh, we've been just leveraging on a lot of the uh, 3D printers or various uh, kind of uh, uh, ways to be able to hand make our prototypes uh, with as little cost as possible. So yeah, we, we were looking at every single dollar that we uh, had in the bank and constantly be very careful about how we spend and stretch every dollar as much as possible. Yeah. Right. Thank you, David. Now, you know, um, um, all of us, we all go through crisis during uh, our times of uh, business and enterprise. Some of us go through many crises and some of us overcome it. Some of us come up with uh, battle scars that are very painful. But at, at this point, I, I'd like to uh, ask uh, the panelists here, what's the one crisis that you went through? And then what continues to drive you despite this kind of crisis? Uh, let's start with Joy. What kind of crisis did you experience and what continues to drive you? Yeah, I think um, the crisis that hit was unexpected. Um, so I expected business challenges, operational challenges. Um, uh, financially, we were okay, but what is, something that blindsided me was um, the impact on our other programs under our umbrella. So what happened was um, when when we started recruiting refugees to join the program, we had to be um, quite selective and also move very rapidly because we had such strong um, fast demand from our partner company but that didn't give us enough chance to figure out the communication strategy around this um, when we recruit and we wanted to keep it very low profile because this is the first time we're doing something involving income generation and refugees um, and so when we were recruiting refugees what happened was uh, there was quite a lot of distrust that suddenly grew in our refugee education program. And uh, some rumors were starting to spread about Bursama um, that were completely yeah. untrue, right? And, and misperceptions. But we also had to figure out a communication strategy where we don't say too much because anything you say in that kind of context can be taken and spun out further. Um, and we are a local organization, so we have to be very careful in managing what information we put out there. And because we have a very strict NDA with our partner company too, <laughs> about what we do, what kind of data we label and all that. So it was a very challenging time relationally, um, addressing some of the, the um, trust issues that grew uh, with some of our other refugee initiatives under our organization, making sure that Bursama's growth was not going to negatively impact or hold back our other work. Um, and making sure that people understand uh, this is to help people, it's not to take advantage of people. And especially in the NGO sector, I think uh, people all, there's an allergy, um, allergic reaction to anything for profit. And that's, <laughs> that is a frustration of mine too. It's until they need donations, you know, they'll say, oh, for profit, you know, uh, initiatives might be take automatically there's an adversarial position um, and so trying to build trust all around that program and making sure people understand this is a clean program this is not taking advantage of people but we can't say too much because of the industry we're in uh, it was about three to four months of managing communication around that and rebuilding trust with some of our key refugee leaders and a, a big lesson I learned from that is um, communication strategy is very critical, especially when working with low income populations or marginalized people. And having that trust laid out in advance and being very proactive with the, lead, the key leaders uh, is absolutely critical. Otherwise it could just totally mess up and distract you from all the other things you have to think about. 
All right. So what keeps you going? What continues to drive you? Why are you doing well, that? I think what continues to drive is seeing the results. Um, you know, we had one guy come in. He was living, he was homeless. Um, he was living in a, a there were, at that time when we started, there was also refugee protests in the city because people were so desperate. They were living on the streets, about a thousand people waiting for assistance or something to come from the government. So in that context, some of them were coming to training. They hadn't started paid work yet, but they hung on through the training. They continued to train with us, get oriented. And once they started um, earning, they could finally move into a place and afford rent. Uh, but some one guy in particular, he couldn't even type properly. <laughs> and uh, I just thought, how are we going to bring him to a point where he's labeling data because you have to type accurate words and spelling and sometimes punctuation matters too. But this guy, um, he, he went from homelessness to having a home and then he stuck with it and challenged himself to uh, type different typing speeds. And seeing that progress and seeing how he built Indonesian friendship, uh, friendships with Indonesians and then just turned into this completely self-confident individual in the matter of three to four months, you know, seeing stories like that um, told me this is absolutely worth it. And he's still with us and his English has really improved too. So wow. when you see the individual inspiring. stories, it, it really pushes you forward. That's very inspiring. Okay, Daniel, how about you, Daniel? Did you ever experience a big crisis, uh, Daniel, during your, um, uh, your enterprise? And what continues to drive you? Uh, Daniel? Yes. 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 Uh, what's the crisis? Uh, I think every day is a crisis to me. So uh, <laughs> every day, every single day, you know why? Because the, the people that we are dealing with and the employees that we are dealing with are different groups of, 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 of beneficiaries. So uh, we do have, uh, as right now, in COVID seasons, there are many social issues that are rising up. You know, some of them uh, are affected by the COVID and they are emotionally affected. Uh, some of them might be even um, a parent's suggestion from them coming to work. You know, with that, that give us issues. Why? We have not, we have manpower issues as well. So with that, um, all this, but how do we really overcome? Uh, just do it. Lah. <laughs> <laughs> the key thing is that uh, if there is no solution up front, uh, the thing is just, just, just remain the flow. You know, just continue with what you are doing and continue to do good. You know, yes, time may be hard. Times may be uh, tough as well. But uh, just hang on. The, the key thing is just hang on. And um, how about financial? Uh, financially, um, I do face two financial difficulties throughout my whole career at, at Pope Jai. Uh, there's two times, you know, that uh, Pope Jai almost bankrupt. Okay, twice. Okay, but yet, uh, uh, what I did is, you no, know, ah, what should I do at this stage where um, we don't take funds? Because uh, I, I strongly believe in is that, hey, Pope Chai needs to go for our business first and not by grants, not by fundings. So for the past eight years, we have not really tapped into any grants and funds. We have been running it through business. And who are our funders? There's only one answer, our consumers, our patrons. They are the one who purchase our meals. As long as you serve good food, good service, that's how it goes. No? Um, so with that, you know, we, we always find new ways to break through. So we, we came out with different revenues, like uh, dining, we have delivery service. We even have uh, workshops and things that you have never think of. We even have a production arm where we're doing e-commerce, you know, by tapping on the strength and weaknesses, understanding our strength and weaknesses from the company itself and our employees' constraints and limitations, we find ways to overcome it together as a whole body. In COVID season, in COVID season, um, we, we started our island-wide delivery, uh, delivery service. Uh, that was crazy. 
it was within 24 hours, within 24 hours, we came out with this delivery service and said that, hey, since that uh, taxi drivers are, are, are jobless or even they are affected incomes, how can we really support them? So with that, I came up with a crazy promotions and we say that, hey, I came up with an 880 promotion. Since it's eight years anniversary, right? My pop giant. So I was saying that, hey, why not I do it? 880, you know, everything eight, you know, as a form of helping as well. So 888, la, fa, 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 la. <laughs> right? So, so, that's like how, that. <laughs> so that's how we did it. Uh, in fact, uh, right now on a daily basis, we have about 20 to 30 orders, you know, and, and right now, even they, we are serving 5,000 meals in the past three weeks. And, and that was really, really crazy. So, uh, in conclusion, I would say that I don't just hang on during this difficult period. Yeah. That's very encouraging. I think we better order some meals right now. <laughs> um, right, over to David. Now, David, what was one of the biggest crisis you guys went through and 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 David you know after going through that crisis um, why did you continue uh, I think just now I mentioned about financial crisis but I think I'll move on to another another crisis that I can share uh, I think within the first two years we had another situation was uh, that our technology started to be replicated and copied uh, such that I could see it being sold on Alibaba uh, using our own pictures and uh, <laughs> even even grabbing our case studies and, and some of the pictures that we took uh, with our beneficiaries as their marketing material. Oh, yeah. uh, I think that's the reality when we're doing hardware, which is that uh, good products could potentially be copied, especially because uh, at the start, we did not have uh, money to do intellectual property uh, management, uh, like uh, patents or filing of these uh, uh, IP protection. Uh, anyway, I think even if we did that, it may not have helped because uh, IP is just one level. If in order to bring them to court, you need to have uh, enough uh, watches of of funds. So. I think what we did was that we just moved on. We just uh, moved on to a new product and see that we are an innovative company and we have to be able to, to keep moving forward in terms of technology and, and that's our strength. So we, we just moved on to the next product and this one we made it much more uh, carefully in terms of selecting suppliers, in terms of selecting the, uh, the uh, getting a, a law firm to help us to, to do some basic protection. Uh, but I think IP only protects to a certain level. You have to really, really innovate in terms of the the product uh, uh, production so that uh, certain parts are, are known as your secret source and certain parts you can still outsource. And so that's what we do today, uh, which is we are very careful with, with uh, who we rely on when it comes to helping on production and which are the parts that we can outsource. Yeah, I think what continue to drive us uh, even as we go through such things because it can be quite demoralizing to the team or those who are the, the R&D team. Uh, but every time uh, we, we face this, we remember of the days that we, we are out in the field and even when we're testing the product, uh, there will be, when we bring our products into the villages, there will be long lines of people who, who will hear about what uh, the system we have and start to queue in front of us with their buckets and pails and, and all, the, all their containers so that they can be able to collect that clean water for drinking water for that day. And just to see that queue, people can be queuing for hours. Uh, uh, it just touches and warms our heart that something like this, which we, we, we didn't think uh, uh, could have uh, impacted so many lives, uh, could actually... Uh, uh, lead many people to want to desire to to even queue up for hours for for the use of the system. So I think that just being on the ground really helps a lot of, a lot of times uh, in terms of our motivation uh, to be reconnected with why we are doing what we're doing. Uh, so yeah, I encourage that uh, any any other social enterprises uh, just be be regularly in touch with your consumers and beneficiaries, and I think that itself is the driver a lot of times for why we are doing what we are doing. Wow, cool, cool. Right, Joan, over to you now, Joan. What crisis did you experience and what continues to drive you today? Yep. 
happy to share. Uh, and thank you so much, fellow panelists. I am truly inspired by all the stories so far. Uh, it, it's really it's really been a journey for all of us. Uh, I think for us, the crisis, and I don't know if it can be categorized as a, a crisis per se, uh, because I'm, I tend to look at it always as like a silver lining. Uh, but when the COVID-19 pandemic hit, uh, it really stretched our operational capabilities to the seams. Uh, we, like I said in the beginning, we did not start out as a health tech company. So we did not take the traditional path of trying to raise a lot of money and then figure out, you know, the product and the product market fit and all of that. We really started out from the ground and build it from the ground up as an organization with very lean operations and minimal, minimal funding. And so when the pandemic hit, and we saw demand surge for mental wellness services uh, on both sides. So because the platform is a two-sided marketplace for Thoughtful Chat, not only do we have the users who require you know, daily bite-sized coaching or mental wellness support, uh, we also have the other side of the marketplace who are all our professionals. And these are all you know, either certified or registered counselors and psychologists who whose main rice bowl has always been in the traditional face-to-face -face model. And all of a sudden, all their business was completely wiped because they couldn't see any clients anymore. Uh, and, and everyone is charged on a per hour basis, which means mm. that income started becoming very challenging for them. And so we saw a surge both on the user side, but also suddenly on the professional side. And there was a lot of upskilling that needed to be done in a very short time span because we were basically doing, I guess, digital transformation, but for the mental health ecosystem specifically. So very niche, obviously. Uh, and, and all of this happened within a week to two weeks. <laughs> uh, and, so, and so in the last... I, I can safely say, you know, in the last um, month and a half, the team has grown by three times. Um, wow. We have had to really just scale very quickly. And, and our, our app was supposed to be launched next month. We brought it forward by a month. Uh, it was just a lot of, a lot of things that were kind of happening at the same time. We were also in the midst of, uh, starting to fundraise for the first time because because we uh, you know we, we've basically evolved into um, I, I guess more of a tech product uh, and, and we wanted to do it in the impact space and so you know the, there were all these uh, and, and you know financial markets are not doing well so there are all these things that were happening all at the same time uh, and I had to say that personally uh, it was also a bit, maybe this part made it the crisis, but I'm actually stuck in KL for the, and I have been for the last three months away from my husband because the borders closed on the day that I was supposed to return back to Singapore. Uh -huh. uh, so there is all these things happening. Um, I just got my approval. So hopefully I'll be back in Singapore. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there were all these things happening and it all happened at the same time very quickly. Uh, and, and, you know, it meant that we had to, uh, pivot very quickly we had to learn and just like Daniel said right like just roll with the punches every day whatever needs to be done you just do it uh, and, 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 and kind of uh, grow as fast as you can um, but I think I've been very blessed that you know everyone's healthy we can all still work uh, the team's great uh, so so that really helped with navigating through this whole uh, this whole scenario um, we we picked, I guess, a very interesting time for market entry at this point. Um, but I, I guess, you know, there's a lot of anxiety. It sounds like a, a good kind of crisis, but but still it is a situation that causes a lot of anxiety because there's a lot of demands to be met. Uh, and, and, you know, when you're a young company, you cannot risk the the, the situation of letting, you know, letting people down. I mean, you have users who have very real issues with, with uh, mental health challenges who need servicing. And then you have professionals whose rice bowl, you know, whose income is dependent on at least a part of the business on your side. Uh, so there were just all these stakeholders uh, and beneficiaries that we needed to make sure 
um, were all taken care of and we still are in that process. Uh, I think it will be a process that's ongoing. Uh, but, but I think it's, you know, despite the anxiety and the, uh, and all the stress uh, and pressure that came, uh, I think, you know, what continues to drive, um, drive us is again, that very clear vision of wanting to build a world where mental health is as aspirational as physical health. And the fact that we know that there are so many problems in the mental health ecosystem that needs solving uh, and our acute awareness that what we're doing is just a very small tip of the iceberg of a larger ecosystem of problems that need to uh, be solved it is really what drives us every day. Um, and we hope to you know, pioneer digital mental health care and provide end-to-end -end servicing uh, all the way from preventive to curative to rehabilitative. And you know that's something that will be a journey that's long-term for sure. Uh, so mm -hmm. I think that vision drives us a lot every day. Oh, very good. Because uh, you talked about something that I wanted to ask all the panelists here, and that was the impact of COVID uh, on your business, the COVID-19 on your business. And, and and you know, John, the you know from from your story, we can see that the COVID situation has caused us all to compress everything we're trying to do in four weeks. So you know, I like to find out a little bit uh, from you. You know, there's so many balls in the air that you're trying to juggle on you know, your app, your the performance of your app, your you know your customers, your the, the service providers. How do you manage so many balls in the air? Uh, by proactively engaging in my mental health. <laughs> um, I, I, I say this half jokingly, but, but it is true. Uh, I think now more than ever, there's just so much noise. And we were just talking to, to a, a corporate client this morning. And essentially, the problem, it's funny because what you said is we're compressed to do everything that we were already doing, but in a shorter time span. Uh, and, and so what we're actually facing these days is not a problem of, uh, it might not necessarily be a pro problem of like productivity or just a health issue, but it's also the aspect of everyone overworking a bit too much. Uh, and, and this might be true in, in countries where you have connectivity, you can work from home seamlessly, and then you fall into the trap of not knowing when to stop, how to work. Uh, and, and I've definitely fallen into that for sure. Uh, and, and like you said, I'm juggling not just oranges, I'm juggling like mangoes and apples and everything's up in the air. And, and we're trying to make it go seamlessly into a fruit basket. Uh, um, but it, it's, it's knowing when I take that time off. Um, it, it's, it's a lot going on. I also uh, have to manage uh, or take care of elderly uh, in my household. Um, because I am back with family right now and, and there's all these uncertainties um, surrounding us. And so, yeah, just really reaching out for help, uh, asking for support. Um, definitely, I think for two weeks straight, I was just asking for support in all sorts of, uh, of, of avenues. Uh, and, and it's not just business related, like, you know, legal, how to hire faster, how to do this, how to do that. Um, but it was also just how do I switch off at 3 a.m.? I'm still either working or still <laughs> thinking about work. And, and these are very real considerations. And so, yeah, just, just building in routines um, and, and building in, um, setting up a routine, building in the discipline of, of uh, having small habits that you do every day that does help you to de-stress de and switch off. For me, it's journaling and yoga. Uh, sounds a little bit, you know, like, cliche, but it is true. I've been doing this for the last six years now. Um, it's something I still do uh, uh, very, very often. Um, but it's really being able to, finding the avenue to take a step back uh, and to figure out, okay, does the mango belong here? Or maybe it's only an apple and orange time right now. Um, and, you know, just making sure that you, you have space to uh, stop accept what's happening, adapt, and also act accordingly. Yeah, I guess that's what resilience is, right? Yeah, um, cool. Regardless cool. of what happens, yeah. Yeah, wow, that's interesting. Thank you so much for that. Um, David, how is COVID-19 uh, impacting your enterprise, David? 
Yeah, it's definitely something that has uh, hit us uh, because we used to do a lot of things by having to travel internationally. Uh, when we do deployment work, we have to travel from Singapore uh, because that's where we're based in and into many of the region, regional countries. Uh, so uh, actually this year, we were focusing a lot on Indonesia and Philippines. And uh, in March uh, was the first time that we heard about the lockdown situation in Manila. Uh, that already took us back quite a bit. So uh, uh, subsequently, when when Singapore placed uh, the requirement for 14 days stay home notice, if you come back from any place in ASEAN, that was it. That was like the final straw. And we realized that we have to pivot uh, in terms of the sales uh, strategies that we have. So I'm actually glad that now uh, the, the entire industry has uh, started to move towards a more digital approach. And this actually helped us a lot because uh, previously when we were trying to deal with distributors or, or representatives on the ground, uh, they tend to be much more traditional, which means that they prefer you to come over and meet them face to face. But now this has uh, totally changed because a lot of our distributors are much more familiar with what it means to work through Skype or through uh, online media. So we are, we are moving a lot of things digital now. So in terms of our uh, e-commerce channels, our selling process, our uh, demonstration process, a lot of these things have to be done uh, digitally. And that's a lot of uh, internal work that we, we had to swing towards. And I'm glad that we have the time to be able to do that now. Uh, given that things are, are much slower and, and we are taking a whole different approach uh, to how we are doing sales in the future. And actually doing all these digital uh, strategies help us in the future to scale up much quickly because that means that we can be able to target any country in the world and be able to onboard our distributors, onboard our representatives on the ground much more quicker. And also our new customers, they have the privilege of being able to, to understand how to use our products and systems uh, virtually. Instead of previously, we had to go down physically and be able to sh uh, teach them, show them, do a workshop. Now we, can, we are building all this uh, online so that it becomes a lot more effective. Yeah, I think uh, on other aspects of, uh, say, cash flow management, uh, what we've done is also to uh, look at what the low hanging fruits in terms of uh, products that can that can be quickly uh, uh, do do some quick marketing to gain a bit of uh, traction. I think uh, we've uh, explored how we can use uh, some of our product. Uh, uh, solutions in other industries as well. So uh, we, we, we spend this time to do quite a lot of uh, market research and, and a lot of people are willing to help and speak to us because uh, they, they, are, they, they are at home and, and they know that this is to help uh, uh, a startup or a social enterprise be able to figure out uh, what aspects they can pivot into. And actually a lot of, a lot of people have been very generous in helping the moment we, we blast out a message on LinkedIn saying that uh, we're actually trying to discover whether our products can be used in another industry. Is this, uh, do you have any contacts? Please just link us up. And we are surprised because that really uh, helped us. A lot of other people have helped us uh, to link up with their contacts or referrals uh, to to, that we can conduct interviews with and, and be able to understand whether our, our solutions can be applied in that industry as well. So I think this has uh, really forced us to move fast in innovation, in pivoting and in digitalization. Ah, okay, that's, uh, that's very nice. Thanks for sharing that, uh, David. How about you, Daniel? I think uh, we're talking about has COVID impacted your business? Uh, it seems that COVID is actually uh, causing a situation where you really have to send more deliveries and all that. Uh, is that very impactful on you right now, Daniel? Of course it is. See, um, uh, the whole entire business model that we had for the past uh, eight years, you know, it has been dining focused or even catering services. And, but right now we have to turn into uh, oh, also, also bear in mind that we are now talking about being environmental conscious, you know. So that is a bit contradicting, you know, and that's a struggle for me because right now uh, in this year, uh, we we try to focus more on the environmental. So we try to use uh, reduce plastic waste, uh, you know, and how how can all these things work? But with that, we have to use bento box right now, right? So. 
So, um, but yet I need to sustain my business. So the, the question comes in, should I uh, balance by providing job first to the people who need to feed the families or do I really talk about environmental? I know uh, people will, will, will hoo-ha, but, but this is the question that I need to balance. So the, the key thing is that I need to feed them well first. I need to make sure that they are, they are able to put food to the table first before we can talk about environmental consciousness. We can be environmental conscious in, in many other ways. Okay, One of the ways that we can do, you know, we need to have a solution right, for everything. So one of the things that we need to do is maybe you can bring your own box to us so that we can even do that. So we provide the options for them. And also we don't provide calories as well. But so this whole thing actually changed our way of how we run our business. And in fact, uh, with that, we have decided to keep our island-wide delivery service in the long-term run. So, so these are the things that uh, are making changes. Does that really affect my business income? Uh, yes, it is. It actually affect my business revenue by 90%. Okay, it's very, very bad. Uh, okay. But what to do? Just flow with it. Lah. Yeah. <laughs> very good. Very good. Thank you for telling us that. Uh, Joy, how about you? Has COVID-19 impacted you and your social enterprise? Yeah, it, um, I think it, it forced us to try new things. So we, um, because we serve vulnerable communities, uh, we moved pretty early on into remote work. And thankfully, because um, this is all online work, we could just uh, have everyone start working from home immediately. So we switched to that. It was very challenging because um, the logistics around supporting all our workers, uh, you know, we had to figure out how to monitor everyone through Zoom. And it's not like we have a huge budget, so we're not going to get a pro account for everybody. And so just thinking through what's practical, but how do we stay um, in touch with everyone and, and make sure they're productive. So there was some operational changes we had to make, but it was good because we had thought about exploring it before um, a remote work arrangement and it forced us to try it out um, much earlier than anticipated and we realized we can do it. Um, and so now we're rethinking our whole operational model for post COVID. Do we do, do we have to have a uh, fully in house in facility kind of work arrangement or can we do a blend of remote and in facility work. Uh, and so we're exploring around that. So it's pushed us to be more creative. Um, in terms of business demand, there's been more. Uh, somehow more work has been shifting to our team because uh, I guess other offices or teams in other countries have been affected. And so we've experienced better volume and we're really grateful for that. Uh, but that it's also made us have to expand more quickly. We had to onboard and recruit another whole cohort of members uh, because of the growing demand. And so that's forced us to um, rethink how we onboard. Our onboarding process went from a three week orientation for our first batch and now down to three days. <laughs> so we've, we've condensed a lot of things like uh, Joan was saying, a lot of things have to just happen in a shorter time frame. Wow, okay, yeah, that's interesting. Thanks, thanks for sharing that. Um, I'm heading over to Wayne for a moment. Uh, Wayne, you want to say something, Wayne? Yes, uh, thank you very much, audience. I'm just very aware that uh, we, are, we are coming very close to the end of our one and a half hours. Now, we don't want to rush this. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to do a short commercial break, uh, walk you guys through some administrative stuff, and then we will resume with the audience Q&A. So we do invite the panelists to stay back a little bit, uh, to make sure that you are able to interact with some of the questions because we have some pretty interesting good questions coming up, right? And we want to make sure we give enough airtime to that. So the first thing we want to talk about is the resilience program. Now, you guys may have heard us talking a little bit about it, but I think it's good for me to just emphasize. Like we mentioned, the resilience program has three legs. The first one has to do with matchmaking, whereby we connect prospective funders with interesting social enterprises, right? So we are not too much involved in that other than introducing the right people to the right people. The second piece is we actually, uh, we actually have targeted grants or what we call productive charity, 
where we don't fund the social enterprise, but we actually fund your suppliers, the social enterprises suppliers to make sure the community continues to be producers. And the last but not least is actually the debt financing part. Now we are only piloting this in Indonesia and Malaysia right now, whereby we actually give you a small bridge financing uh, to be, help you to tide through the difficult moment and help you to be more resilient, which is what this program is all about. So there are two ways to do this. Next slide, please. If you're a donor, uh, we, do, we do invite you to actually uh, give, uh, knowing that every cent that you give goes directly either to the social enterprise or to the communities that they are supporting. If you're a social enterprise and you, you feel that this resilience program can help you, we also invite you to apply. So you, the links have been posted onto the, in the chat group. So take a look on the chat window. You can just click on it uh, and find out more. Okay. Also, just to take note, we have a very exciting uh, panel coming up as well at 5 p.m. And this is talking about how CEOs, like the ones that you see on this panel, also need support and what kind of support you can, you can look forward to uh, within the TBN ecosystem. So the panel is going to be moderated by Christy Davis, the Executive Director of Lien Center for Social Innovation. So make sure you dial back in and enjoy the next panel. Also, Tickets are still available. Help us to spread the word, tag our sessions. Uh, friends, don't let friends miss out on good events and good panels like this. So please make sure you share and we believe there are a lot more that can benefit from a session like this. Connect with us. Um, as you, can, you know, that we have five pillars to TBN Asia, and in case you, have, you want to find out more because the panels are moving too fast, you didn't get a chance to reach out to all of us, our contact details are here. You may also reach, us, reach out to us on the app. Make sure you connect with us, ask all the questions. We invite all questions and all inquiries from you. Last but not least, we have the Social Enterprise Saturday. Uh, we have actually a lineup 36 social enterprises where you actually get to hear them quickly talk about their, their businesses and you can find out more about them, ask them questions. They will tell you what they need and what support they, they can expect. Uh, so we do hope that you can join us this Saturday. It will be running from 9 a.m. all the way to 1.30 and last I heard it could even go all the way to 3 p.m. because we have more social enterprises coming on to the, pet, to the program. Okay, so this is the part where we, if you can, we invite you to stay on and just to continue asking some of the questions. We will actually open up the chat panel already on the left side. Um, and we want to make sure that you are able to ask the, all the questions you want. If you, you didn't feel comfortable posting your questions on the Q&A, this is the part where you can actually key in your questions directly and if it's more natural, right? But before we go into the Q&A, we just want to make sure we flash one last poll for the day. Can we flash the last poll, please? Yes, we just want to, before you, in case some of you guys need to drop out, we just want to make sure that we can capture some of our feed, some of your feedback on this poll. So I appreciate if you can just spend a quick 10, 15 seconds filling this out before we continue to the Q&A. Okay, let me just give it another 10 seconds if that's okay. All right, keep them coming in. Okay, I think we're good to go. Oh, we have a couple coming in, a couple more coming in. So let me just wait for a short while.
All right. I will end. I will stop the poll here. Okay. All right, Chris. Back to you. Uh, on some of the questions, I think we have some pretty interesting ones I see here. I'll yeah, let you take it some away. Of them, some of them are quite fun. Okay, so how I'm going to do this is I'm going to leave it open for any of the panelists to uh, answer uh, these questions. All right, so uh, you're not obligated to answer, but uh, you'll be good if you do. And the first one is a hard one, right? The first one is when does one give up? Is there a line that when you cross it, you say, okay, I'm done. I'm not continuing with this social enterprise. Any of you, David, Daniel, Joy, Joan, any of you can answer, which one will be first? When does one give up? Uh, oh, David, I see you've unmuted. Go ahead, I'll okay. come after you. Go ahead, David. Right, okay. Uh because I failed in one business before, uh, Waterroom isn't my first business, and I've uh, done another tech, uh, food tech related startup before, uh, which was doing POS uh, related systems for the F&B industry. Uh, that was even before I graduated. And uh, after one and a half years, uh, even after raising VC money, uh, we had to fold that. Uh, one of the key reasons why we did that is after analyzing the product market fit. So I think if we look at the product market fit and you have tried and tried and s somehow it just uh, is very difficult to get a uh, response from consumers or the, the businesses uh, that you're trying to target uh, to, to realize the benefits of your value proposition. And also in terms of your delivery, the channels, uh, if you are trying to deliver it through a channel that is too expensive beyond the cost that, that your users are willing to pay for, or maybe the cash flows are just coming in too slow, such that the rest of the founders have uh, begun to lose passion on this and realize that the market is too limited and too small. Uh, then I think there's no point trying to pump in additional funding because uh, the product market fit is not there and maybe there's only so much runway that you can go about. Uh, of course, if the, the founders are still very passionate and you still can pivot and pivot and pivot, then yes, maybe that's, that's still possible. But I think there's definitely a limitation when it comes to passion and also uh, in terms of funding, there's real life needs that eventually needs to be paid for. So those things are considerations when uh, thinking about whether the chapter should come to a close. Okay, um, thank you. Over to you, John. How about you? Uh, yeah, I think uh, echoing what Daniel was saying too, right? One is the financial sustainability, but I think especially when we're working in the impact space, uh, regardless of what industry we're in, uh, at one point we have to start asking ourselves, are we doing more harm than good? I think a lot of times in the impact space, what we do is we focus so much on all the positive impact and measuring that and we become really scientific about it and all of that, uh, that sometimes at some point, uh, we completely forget about measuring the other side of the equation, which are the potential negative impacts that our initiatives or that our business is actually generating in what we're doing. Uh, and so that's probably one benchmark to look at or one uh, litmus test to do. Uh, a lot of it as well, you know, boils down to financial sustainability, as David, David pointed out. Uh, at some point, uh, the runway, if let's say the product market fit is not um, thought about, or if let's say it was not even built to be financially sustainable in the first place, then it's probably a house of cards that's waiting to be just blown apart. Uh, and, and, and then we have to start doing thought experiments, right? Like if that actually happens, worst case scenario, then what negative impacts will happen. It could be on our beneficiaries, it could be on our stakeholders, it could be on ourselves. Will it damage relationships? Will it damage our, you know, our um, psychological mental health? Uh, because it, 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 burnout is, is something that 70% of entrepreneurs go through mm. uh, and yeah. that does not yeah. include uh, uh, what they call compassion fatigue, which is an added layer of challenge that social entrepreneurs go through because they actually 
care about their beneficiaries and they're trying trying to do good for their beneficiaries. Uh, so these are all the components that we'll definitely um, need to look into when we make that judgment call of whether to, as they say, cut loss or continue uh, thriving. So, yeah. Wow, that's very insightful, very insightful. Uh, fatigue, wow. <laughs> All right, Joy, I see you're unmuting yourself, Joy. Yeah, I would fully agree um, with what David and Joan said. And I would also say, uh, let the number speak too, and maybe get an advisor, get someone outside of you to look at it and give you a good concrete um, uh, perspective that, you know, we have our own personal biases. And especially if you created the enterprise, you're the founder, it's your baby. So you, there's an automatic bias. If you can get someone else to look at the numbers with you and to look at um, your strategy and, and if the numbers and the, uh, the picture is that it's not a sustainable business, um, I would say the other thing is don't make a decision out of fear, but out of just reality based on a reality check. Um, I think the worst decisions are made when there's just uh, fear driving it, whether fear of failing everyone. And so you continue no matter what, or fear of, um, you know, if, if you decide to give up, um, don't see that as giving up, but it's just making a good concrete practical decision that you'll learn from and improve you for the future. So in either route you take, just don't let fear drive that decision. That's a very wise advice. Thank you, Joy. I think the next question from the audience is for, for all of you panelists out there. Um, of all the many things, of all the things that you need help on, what is the one biggest thing that you want to ask from anyone? What's the one biggest thing? What's your one biggest help? Any one of you can answer. Joan. Yeah. Go ahead, Daniel. Oh, can I answer? Yes, of course. Please. Of course. So one of the things that many, if there's only one us that uh, I can ask for, and the most practical is order my food right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and, and that is what we need. We need continuous support, not just a one time off support, not just, uh, you know, high buy, but a continuous support. And, and that is something that uh, encourage us and keep us moving. You know, this, this is the most practical thing, you know, and that with that, that gives me income, that gives me jobs, and that gives me training to my employees. All right. So, yeah, hand over to you. Cool. Yes, Daniel, we are very hungry right now. Yeah, very. <laughs> I think someone from my team was asking me for my address uh, for home delivery. So, let's see. Uh, Joan, over to you, Joan. Uh, I think similar to, to Daniel, right? At this point, of course, you know, grants and all of that is one thing that will help. But I think the ultimate thing that helps, again, with the financial sustainability is actual business. And and for thoughtful uh, with a B2B2C model um, that, that we're uh, more focused on right now, uh, that will be introductions to a head of human resource departments in companies. So if you guys know people in HR, in talent management, uh, uh, in, in, in companies, let us know because uh, we would love to get in touch with them. Thank you. That is so cool. All right, David. Yeah, I think for us, uh, our ask is uh, to learn how to do manufacturing even more efficiently so that we can bring our product costs to much more affordable um, means for for our consumers right uh right now we do understand that sometimes our product can still be on the more premium side but uh because we are really looking from this as a social impact angle uh we are looking at how to drive costs if down efficiently and to eventually be able to reach out to even greater masses of uh, people who may still be lacking clean drinking water so uh, we're hoping to be able to learn uh, such efficiencies in manufacturing. Okay, cool. Uh, there's one more question from the audience that I think we should really do. And that is, what's one of your greatest failure and what are the lessons that you and the audience 
can learn from that uh, failure. Any one of you? What's one of your greatest failure? And what can we learn? Daniel. Okay, one of the greatest failure, I think, I, I feel a lot. Okay, so in, in this whole life, uh, I've been feeling throughout my whole entire journey. And, and guess what? I enjoy it. Because through failures, I, I learn to rise. And, and through that, I, I learn to build myself up in a, in a bigger capacity. So one of it is, uh, how do we uh, stay humble? You know, and, and, and that is one thing as entrepreneurs, we need to constantly stay humble. All right, and, and not just be arrogant and think that, hey, you know everything, uh, you are a social en en enterprise or social entrepreneur, but how can we really stay humble and, and listen to opinions, listen to suggestions, and, and to do better? So this is one thing that I, I learned, and it's it been a constant reminder to me my, for, for, for my personal capacity. Yeah. Very inspiring. Anyone else from the panel? I think Daniel said something very interesting. He, he gave kind of give a one word uh, to say that stay humble, right? Uh, so I'm just wondering if, if for you guys, you have one last piece of advice or closing thought that you'd like to leave with our, our audience. Uh, what would that be? Just curious. One parting advice for the audience. Uh, right. I think, sorry. Go ahead, John. Uh, yeah, uh, I think for me, it would be to take care of yourself. Um, I, I, and it sounds, it almost sounds uh, selfish, but it's actually uh, coming from a place where if, if you're not fit, healthy, and able to do what you're doing, then you're not going to be able to continue doing the impact that you want to do uh, for the community, for society, for your own family. Uh, and so a lot of times when we're in this startup world, uh, there's always, you know, there's always narratives and people telling you to never give up, always hustle, don't be afraid of, you know, going all out. What do you mean you want to sleep? Blah, 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 blah. Uh, that all this, all this kind of narrative, yes, uh, to a certain extent, it's meant to motivate us, but it's not meant to drive us to the ground because of burnout or exhaustion. Uh, it's very real. And I think it's one of those things where we owe it to not just ourselves, but all the stakeholders and beneficiaries and people who have entrusted us to do the work that we do, that we take care of ourselves to make sure we're, we're always at our best. Um, so that will be my one parting one. Very good. Anyone else? What's your last parting shot and advice? Daniel. Uh, hi guys, it's Lisa again. All right, uh, there's three things that uh, I, I learned. So, uh, <laughs> just three things. It's called a BDM. All right, BDM. All right, uh, B is be humble. Second is do good. And third thing, the most important thing is continue to make money. All right. <laughs> And that's the that's the key, you know. During this COVID season, we 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 need to constantly stay humble, constantly doing good. Even times are so bad, we still have to remember that, you know, we we are there to shine. We are there to 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 do good, you know. And that is the purpose of social enterprise, all right. And the last thing is, you need to make money to sustain. Then you can help people, all right. So that's my piece of advice to you guys. Very good advice. Thank you, Daniel. David, over to you. Oh, look at those food. <laughs> I'm hungry now. By the way, I like that. <laughs> David, over to you, David. Okay. Uh, I think for me, is, uh, I, I like to reiterate what Joan shared uh, because uh, I actually shared about the a process of burnout before and it was covered by a CNBC article. Uh, you can search it online. Uh, but basically, I've learned through the experience that it's important to take care of your health as well as the mental health of your employees. So from the beginning of this uh, entire social enterprise journey, uh, we made it a point to, to, to know that this is a marathon. It's not a sprint. Although it's very glorified a lot of times when we talk about startup culture, you must hustle, you must do 24-7 uh, and, and six days a week kind of work, but uh, it doesn't last. Uh, if you're looking at just doing it for one year, two years, maybe you can do it. But if you're looking at the long haul and sometimes social enterprises tend to take a bit longer for the traction to be built, uh, it's really got to be a marathon. So I think take care of the health of your, 
your em- employees and the, the staff that work for you. Uh, my parting quote is from Jack Ma, uh, who said that uh, today is hard, tomorrow will be worse, but the day after tomorrow will be sunshine. <laughs> so do have the optimistic view as well, as much as uh, uh, it's going to be quite challenging in the near term, especially if you're just starting, but it's a marathon you will eventually get there and there will be sunshine ahead. Very nice. Very nice. Joy, how about you? Your last parting shot. Uh, everyone captured everything I would say. <laughs> uh, I think uh, here's a co- practical advice is cash is king. <laughs> this is what um, a lot of entrepreneurs, uh, they get tripped up with in, you know, income, expense and all that. But at the end of the day, uh, cash is the blood of the business. And if the body's not alive, you can't serve people, you can't help people uh, through your social enterprise. So don't forget the practical realities um, that you're facing. Don't deny it and surround yourself with good advisors. So those are the two things. That's very nice. Very nice. All right. That brings Chris, us to the I, end. I would, like, I yes. would like you to have also want to, to share your last word with, the, with everyone. Oh, Okay. Um, I think for me, one of the most important thing, uh, at, at least for my life, is uh, always to stay close uh, to God. So um, I, I find that without God, I could not have uh, reached where I am. And, and I never felt to tell people about that. And sometimes when I tell journalists about that, they don't know how to write that. But uh, <laughs> I, I know one particular journalist actually wrote that down. And I think I'm here only by the grace of God. Over to you, Wayne. Thank you so much, Chris, and the panelists for your generous sharing. We understand that this is not exactly the easiest panel. uh, And we understand that it's not going to be easy to get to some of the key stories. But I think you guys did actually share very, very genuinely your struggles and how you overcome from, I hear stories from bankruptcy to uh, product piracy, to even being apart from your loved ones, right? In the, in the midst of this COVID-19. And who's to say which one of this crisis is more than the other? Um, so to all the social entrepreneurs on the call, I will encourage our advice and encouragement to you is keep going, but uh, you would know when to make the right decision. There's no, to be honest, I, I'm not even sure there is a right or wrong decision from time to time. Really, I think you would know. And please practice uh, discretion, practice uh, wisdom. It is going to be a long journey. So continue to hang on and be inspired by the stories of others. And we thank you very much and we'll see you at 5 p.m. Thank you so much. And thank you once again to our wonderful panelists and moderator. We'll see you.